Well, thanks very much. And it's a real pleasure to be here. And I was reflecting actually this morning about how different a talk this feels from a, a, an equivalent talk I probably gave about four years ago, um, where I talked about recovery and recovery principles. And uh, at that point, here, as in the UK, this was quite a kind of contentious issue, the whole issue of defining recovery and was it a viable or useful philosophy was a, the subject of much conjecture and much debate. And people were very concerned about this and exactly the same issue still may, uh, persists around some of the aspects of community connections. And I'm going to come at this from two different perspectives. One around uh, recovery and the second around desistance. And for both of those things, so recovery primarily is an issue for alcohol and drugs. Desistance is an issue for um, offending. But really from my perspective, really what I want to talk about is the, no the implication this has for social justice. And the, 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 the uniting theme for me is a question of social justice and the role that everyone plays in enabling the possibility of effective reintegration. What I intend to talk about is how communities can facilitate or block attempts people make to uh, rehabilitate and reintegrate. And I'll sometimes use the word recovery and sometimes I won't use the word recovery. And if you don't like the word recovery, please don't let that bog you down about what I intend to talk about, which is primarily about can we as a community facilitate and support the process of effective reintegration? Um, and some of this work actually starts here. When I was here, Michael Savage, who's sat over there with the tremendous beard, <laughs> and myself, um, uh, did some work in Dandenong Magistrates Court where we started trying to work out how could we support people who were repeat offenders, who were going through the same low level of offended associated with their alcohol and drug use. And we, we started a process where our aim was to say, can we find things for pe alternative meaningful activities for people to engage in uh, and people to actively pursue? And in both the US and the UK, this is commonly referred to as asset-based community development or asset mapping. And asset mapping has become this huge ish issue for, for public health and is, is part of social prescribing in the UK and is now a widespread phenomenon in response to a, a range of exclusions and uh, 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 marginalised populations. So, so we did some work in, in Dandenong with the Magistrates Court. We were supported by two very uh, positive magistrates in this process. And we'll, contrary to lots of people's expectations about Dandenong, we successfully identified 99 assets in the local community that people could potentially engage with following criminal justice uh, activity. I then followed that up with some work with the Salvation Army on the East Coast um, where they had two uh, rehabs, Fairhaven and Duralong. Uh, and we, we repeated this process. And here we, we, we started changing the language and the dialogue a little bit because I think one of the problems of asset-based community development as a model is the assumption is that you have clients <coughs> who are in need. There are assets out there your clients tap into those assets and effectively draw from the asset pool in the community. But I wanted to be clear, and all the projects that I'll talk about here rest on a different assumption, that the clients themselves have strengths and are assets and contribute. And that this is not somehow a bank where you draw money out of the bank or draw assets out of the bank, leaving the bank depleted. The idea is that this is a sustainable, positive sub game that in other words, the community enriches. And we know from the, the, for people who are interested in the idea of recovery capital, we think of recovery capital not as a static fixed thing that you draw on and there's less of it at the end. In some ways, the opposite is true. You draw on it and there's more afterwards than there was before because the process is generative and evolutionary and developmental and is fundamentally about tapping into those those resources to build resources. And I'll come back to this time and time again over the course of this presentation. Um, so we, we, in the work we did with the Salvation Army, we termed this reciprocal community development. And it's important from the perspective of challenging stigma and exclusion that you say, 
our clients don't draw from assets. They provide assets, they draw assets, and overall, they support and sustain what we'll call a therapeutic landscape for recovery. They make the community more connected. They make the community more viable through this process. And I think it's important that we understand that this is a generative thing. OK, so the, the first project I intend to talk about in the UK, uh, we got some money from the Health Foundation uh, in the UK. Uh, to partner up with a whole range of organisations across the top, including the City Council and the local NHS Trust, um, and a non-statutory service called Sheffield Alcohol Support Service. And we did exactly the same thing. So we started with this assumption of, can we identify assets? But we did it in a slightly different way. So the first stage for us was to say, we'll take people who are established recovery, uh, re establishing their own recovery journeys, and we'll get them to go out and identify assets. And what did we do? We, we recruited 21 people who were at least a year into their own recovery journey, and we trained them to work together as a group. So we created what we called a community connectors group. And that community connectors group made their own rules. We supported it as a genuine co-production. We started the process of training them in the principles of ABCD, in the principles of recovery pathways, and in the principles of uh, community engagement and community activism. But then we effectively left it to them to manage all those things about do you give out your phone number? Do you let people contact you late at night? Do you meet people in pubs or do you only meet them in cafes? You make the rules. We're not making the rules for you with this stuff. And we, we started them on the road of saying, find the assets and find us connectors. And it wasn't a complicated task. And we, in the initial instance, we just gave them a month to do it. And we started, as we've done with each of these things, saying, right, broadly we imagine the kind of things you want to find in the community are four categories of stuff. Mutual aid groups, recreation and sport groups, volunteering, education and employment, and peer and recovery community groups. And people have kind of said, well, what's the difference between this one and this one? Well, mutual aid groups are the big kind of AA, NA, large established organisations. These are the far more local granular activities that pop up in local areas that aren't connected to national or international organisations. So the idea was to, to specifically, because ABCD works on the idea of three kinds of assets. There's people, there's informal groups and associations, and there's structure systems and organisations. And all three of them are assets that you can tap into. And that to be effective in a model, for this to be a systemic model, you have to have some kind of strategic professional group as well as local individual relationships. And, and <clears throat> one of the things that underpins this model is the idea that these relationships already exist, but they're carried by individuals who, if they move or leave, those relationships fade. And how do you make those relationships more sustainable and uh, viable over time. So I'm not going to go through these all, but this just gives you an idea of the kind of things our group, so we, did, we as professionals didn't do any of the identification. This was all done by our 21 trained connectors. So in total, recreation and sport, mutual aid, peer and recovery community, volunteering education and employment, 134 assets they identified within a month in Sheffield. And it's, there is nothing unique or special about Sheffield. Well, there's lots of things that are unique and special about Sheffield, not least of which there was snowing at the, uh, at the weekend. Um, but this, this is, exists in every community. And if you take in a different group of 21 people, there would be an overlap, but there would be some different groups. And nobody of our 21 connectors, all of whom were well-known figures, would have known more than two-thirds of those groups and assets. So the first thing you have done is you've created a kind of directory, but a living directory. And the directory itself is next to useless because people do these directories all the time. And immediately they become out of date because they're just lists of organizations and telephone numbers that quickly become obsolete. They have to live. You have to find a way that they create two-way movement. Each of these things becomes a bridge. And the connector is the foundation for the bridge. So the person who makes the contact has to find mechanisms to get people from the groups 
into your organization and from your organizations into those groups. So it's a two-way journey. And each of, these, each of these assets in all of those areas is a potential network of community and social capital. Because in my world, if you think of this from a recovery perspective, what effectively we are doing is building support systems to transition people, to support those transitions from the early phases of recovery to stable recovery over time. And just to, go, to finish on that point, the underlying assumption of the pathway to stable recovery is when people get about five years into their recovery journey, it's self-sustaining based on the data from Mike Dennis at uh, um, Chestnut Health Systems in the US. People generally manage it themselves. For that five-year window, external supports are needed. Social capital, community capital. And to manage that process is in essence a process of mobilizing and engaging community assets. Mobilizing and engaging resources to support that process of change. This has all been couched in the language of recovery, but this is even more of a problem in the language of prisons. So roughly 70% in the UK of prisoners have alcohol and drug problems. Equal numbers, if not slightly higher, have established mental health problems. And depending on the type of prison and the type of offence, 40 to 60% will be reconvicted within a year, uh, most of whom will end up back in jail. So you have, a, 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 and in addition to which, you have an additional level of stigmatisation. So in the recovery language of Granfield and Cloud, a, a history of imprisonment constitutes negative recovery capital. It's a barrier to sustaining recovery because, partly because of stigmatization, partly because of the networks you're likely to be involved with, and partly just because of that multiple complexity that's likely to, to be involved. So in one of our local prisons, if um, a roughly half of our prisoners leave uh, our local jail, which is in Doncaster, they become NFA, no fixed abode. So this is a huge challenge to start with. The chances of them effectively finding jobs and becoming re-established extremely slim. I've talked before here about Jobs, Friends and Houses, which is a social enterprise in the northwest of England uh, developed by Lancashire Police for people coming out of prison with alcohol and drug problems. And the idea was they physically built the recovery community. They physically built recovery housing. So they built their own housing, and in doing so, they did an apprenticeship in whichever relevant trade they were interested in. Um, Blackpool is a, an area of significant deprivation. It's an old seaside town in the northwest of England that in the 1960s used to get the whole of Glasgow going on the summer holidays there and now only gets people who are um, refugees, asylum seekers, drug and alcohol users. Basically it's a, a hugely itinerant population living in very run down um, accommodation with high uh, yield to land to private landlords. So effectively what Jobs, Friends and Houses did was to try and build community capital by improving the area, providing people with, with jobs and providing them with housing as the, the end result of that. The aim was to transform the building stock, physically build a recovery community, provide recovery housing pathways and basically what people had to do was when they came out of jail um, they did an eight-week build-it-up course, which was like get familiar and safe on a building site. And then they'd do a two-year apprenticeship in plumbing, joinery, electrician, whatever of those kind of trades that was needed. Okay, so it, it also required people to engage heavily in uh, recovery community activities of the kind I've mentioned earlier. Recovery sports activities, mutual aid groups, but its impact was huge in terms of changes in offending. So we weren't naive enough to ask participants. So this is for the first 50 participants. We weren't going to ask them, how many crimes have you committed? And there are limitations with using police national computer data. Because obviously once you're known to the police, you're significantly more likely to reappear on it. Which makes these findings more, more impressive rather than less so. So for the first 50 clients, they'd had a total of 1,142 recorded offences in the police national computer. 
which constitutes an average of 32 per person. Over criminal careers lasted an average of 13 years. 28 out of the 50 had um, staff, which is clients, had experienced a total of 176 imprisonments before the start. So what we got was when people engaged in this process of developing a positive social identity with a job and a house, their annual offending rate dropped from 2.46 per year to 0.15 per year, uh, a reduction in offending of 94.1%. Um, and associated with that were these kind of massive savings to the public purse. Reductions in imprisonment costs, healthcare costs, benefit claims, and the 55,000 there in benefit claims is reductions in benefit claims and payment of taxes. So for many of these people, they never paid tax before. Uh, and reductions in reoffending costs associated with policing. So we, we did very crude and basic health economics. But the point about this project was it created a pathway for people coming out of prison to some kind of viable sense of, of, of hope um, and a viable pathway to change. But what it also did was it afforded people a new sense of identity about themselves, a new sense of pride and identity about themselves. For all these people, all the people who went through this program, um, we were in a position to engineer a lot of the stuff that went on. And Jobs, Friends and Houses created an open Facebook page. And what we did was we analysed the social network activity around the Facebook page over the course of the first eight months of Jobs, Friends and Houses. And so effectively, basically, we've got month one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and eight. And by the, the, the method of analysing social media posts goes by the delightful name of scraping. Uh, and we scraped the data. And then with, there's two different techniques we used, analytic techniques on this. The first is called, um, this is social network analysis, where we analyse the patterns of linkage between groups. And the second is called LIWC, uh, li Linguistic Interpretation and Word Count. And I'll say a bit about that in a second. But what we were able to do, this is a fabulous measure of bonding and bridging capital. Because if you look, you'll see that there are different colors. So in month one, the, you can see there's a very loose network, disparate scattered network. So, the red and the blue dots are staff and clients. The green dots are outside people who are interested in the Facebook page, who kind of sign up and say supportive things. So effectively, the relationship between the red dots and the red and the blue dots is what we call bonding social capital. It's the intensity of networks within a group. The links to the green dots is bridging social capital. How well does jobs, friends, and houses connect with the outside world? And you will see as time goes by, the clustering gets much, much tighter. You can see that you, can, you can, almost can't distinguish the red and blue dots by months five, six, seven, and eight. They are highly clustered together. In other words, there is strong social network activity. Now, we have since published two papers on this, one in uh, addiction research and theory and one in social science and medicine, because what we found was we used how long people are retained in the program as our outcome indicator. And what we found was the more people move from the outside of the social networks to the center of the social networks, the longer they stay in jobs, friends, and houses. The more embedded or in social identity terms, the more prototypical they become in the group, the longer they stay, the better they're retained. But the second type of software we did was we analyzed the kind of words they used and the more we language they used, so the more times they, they talked about we do things, not the more times they talked about I do things, the better they were retained. So I predicts nothing, we predicts retention. The more you see yourself as belonging to the group, and there were three things that mattered. Network centrality, how close you were to the middle of each of these diagrams. The, how often you talked about jobs, friends, and houses as we, 
and how often your posts on the Facebook site were endorsed by others all predicted how well retained you are. Now, we know from uh, analysis of Facebook that people who use Facebook a lot doesn't have any public health benefit. People who use Facebook a lot and are endorsed by lots of other people has leads to improvements in morbidity and mortality. And effectively what we have here is it, a, a fabulous technique for not asking people socially desirable questions. Because if you ask people about their use of social networks and their use of social media, how nice they are to other people on it, presumably everyone says yes. So this is real-time analysis of how people behave in a real-world setting, not for researchers. And what we also managed to do, we de-anonymized two of the individuals who went from the outside to the center, and we interviewed them. And they effectively endorsed exactly what we said, that for them, the Facebook page represented two things. It represented a safety net to look after yourself and other people. So out of office hours, you could be contacted, and people could support you, and they could engage with you. But other, the, the second key usage was the bridge in capital. It allowed you to talk to other people and make new connections outside the group, bonding and bridging social capital. And this is crucial for, for these groups to sustain and enhance and develop. They can't develop those kind of identities where everything is inward looking. The group becomes stronger and stronger and stronger, but more detached from their wider community. Because otherwise, and this was, this was part of the point we made about our Salvation Army TC paper, Bonding capital without bridging capital means people do really well as long as they never have to leave. But the moment they have to leave, they can't survive because they don't have those links to all those sustainable external resources. But the links to the external sustainable resources doesn't just change the people in jobs, friends and houses or any other group. It changes the community because all of these bridges effectively are challenges to stigma exclusion and marginalization. The aim is to create connected communities. So what are we doing now? The, the prison that people from Jobs, Friends and Houses came out of is called um, Kirkham. And Kirkham is an open prison. Uh, it's not sponsored by Colonel Sanders. <laughs> we'll get on to that shortly. Um, it's an open prison. For people who don't know what an open prison is, an open prison is a, a, a category D prison, which basically long sentence prisoners in the last two years of their sentence will move there. And the idea is a kind of bridge prison, prepares you for return to the community. You could walk out of it any time, there's no locks. But if you walk out of it and you get caught, you'll be back to proper jail. And proper jail's not so nice. So what we did here was, having done those connectors programs in various other ways, we decided that for people who have 15, 20 years in prison, we need to do something different with them. So what we did was we got their families to act as connectors. We recruited families of people in the last six months, pre-release, and we got the families in and trained them up to be community connectors based on some assumptions. Again, you will find that there are people who are very nervous about leaving prison, kind of Shawshank Redemption effect. People don't want to go because they are, especially in a place like Kirkham, it's got a much more relaxed atmosphere. People learn skills, and but they don't want to leave because they will typically have been 15, 20 years in prison. They have no idea how they're going to cope. And although they get what's called Rockle, release and temporary license, they know they're coming back to where it's safe and secure and they don't have to worry about paying bills and all that kind of thing. The, the second implication of this is it's a strength-based model. I'll talk much more about strength-based models shortly, but the, the whole uh, benefit of this approach is if you run a strength-based intervention approach, everyone benefits from it. Everyone benefits from it. And when, when we suggested this firstly, the probation officers at Kirkham kind of sat around the table and said to us, you're having a laugh. There is no way. So you're suggesting we're going to bring in like, you know, the, the, the family members of domestic violence perpetration and we're going to bring in gang members who are saying, well, no, we'll put some restrictions on to start with. But yeah, we're going to bring families in and get them to build bridges into communities for people. Um, and 
the, one of the few things which has been known to work in the criminal justice system is a, is a model developed by a guy called Tony Ward called the Good Lives Model, which is strength-based. In the UK also, there is a recognition, there's a, the, an increase in policy recognition, that family members suffer severely from um, the reintegration of, of ex-prisoners that families will suffer. And there's a great American book actually called A Plague of Prisons, which says, if you've got teenage sons and a 30 to 40 year old male comes back from prison, cause utter chaos for two or three months, returns to prison, you're effectively role modeling the next generation of prisoners. Um, and so in the UK, the Farmer Report last year has started this model of saying, how do we effectively manage to build prison relationships? And so we, we started basically recruiting families. And when we first did this, we, we, we did it in visiting halls. And one of the things that is fascinating if you go into visiting halls in prisons is you kind of think you won't, don't want to interrupt family discussions because they've traveled long distances to spend half an hour. But what you find with a lot of families is after they've done the, you're keeping well, is the food all right? You're looking well. Hmm. What are we going to talk about now? Did you see EastEnders last week? And that's it. And most of them were desperate to talk to us because they had nothing to talk to each other about. And as time goes on, they have less and less to talk to each other about. And if you've been in jail for 15 years, there's almost nothing that, that's not already been covered in letters. So what we did was we, we recruited people. We recruited family members and we did three connectors training sessions. We set them homework about engaging in community connection. And what we have basically found is that there are the first thing to say is we have an almost perfect evaluation. So all of these are between four and five, the ratings of the evaluations for this stuff. But the most important thing about this model is we have a zero dropout and we are ha having growing cohorts of both prisoners and family members volunteering for this. We're now up to three prisons running this. Why? Because it's a strength-based approach. It allows the family member and the prisoner to work together on a hope-based model. So after the first cohort, one of the prisoners came up to us and said, I've been in prison for 15 years, nobody's ever asked me what I'm good at, what I like doing or what I'm good at doing. And what we offer with this is, a, is what I will refer to all the community programs as, as the social contagion of hope. And it affects the prison officers as well. A hope base, so the three pr probation officers who didn't want this program to run are now all active advocates and champions for it. And when we moved from Kirkland, uh, uh, Kirkham in Preston to Doncaster, to Moorland in Doncaster, those three prisoners are now among the trainers. And we now run this as a mixed peer and professional delivered model. Uh, and what effectively it has done for us is created this approach where family members act as Firstly, they, they map activities in the community, they identify resources, but they themselves are stigmatized, ostracized, and socially excluded. So you're effectively provide, building their quality of life, connectedness, and well-being, as well as them creating opening doors for the, the family member coming out. We've already had people achieve employment through this model, and we've got a, we've got a couple of, of massively significant kind of social value projects. So we've got um, one guy who's working with Down syndrome kids through his local mosque uh, as part one of the class. And it's one of those things, nobody else does it. So here is something we get, fulfill somebody's passion and goal and fulfill a social need. And this notion of a strengths-based model underpins the kind of evolution of our prison-based work. So <clears throat> we're now using this work, uh, this work with a uh, key changes, which is a women's prison a uh, program in Merlin, and we're using it in a drug, uh, drug recovery service in Doncaster. What we are also doing in Kirkham, the, the, the kind of trigger prison for this work is, we're doing asset-based community development work in the prison, so we're doing asset mapping within the prison and linking it to asset maps outside the prison to try and do bridge projects of how do you bridge uh, assets in the community with assets in the prison to create a reciprocal community development model. And Kirkham now has a, a farm shop uh, at the prison where they raise a bit of money, but they also, you know, they're contributing to, to local well-being. The other thing that we've started doing is, 
And much of my work has been about recovery capital. Well, in the prisons, we've started developing a model for regulatory capital of how can we use the inspection process. And in, in British prisons, you will typically have four different bodies providing inspectorate functions. How can you use the regulatory process as a strength-based mechanism for developing evidence-based practice? And the regu our, our model of regulatory capital starts with the same kind of assumptions. It's inclusive and it's strength-based. So you have to identify mechanisms for actively engaging prisoners in the regulatory model and the regulatory process. You have to include family members in the regulatory process. But more than anything else, what you have to do is you have to use both of these, and thanks to Dan for this idea, which I've shamelessly stolen, <laughs> is the, um, the change agent network idea of communities of practice. You create strengths-based communities of practice to drive evidence-based practice through a process of regulation. So regulation becomes the enforced external mechanism that creates regulatory capital. What recovery capital adds to this assumption is it changes the notion of regulation as a zero-sum game where there are winners and losers, a punitive model where the regulator enforces to one where it's a shared body of growth and learning. And the idea here is the regulatory process becomes a mechanism for mutual shared benefit, a mechanism for change over time. Okay. And on the subject of which, right, so recovery capital, I'm not going to say what that is. The underlying assumption for all of these models is that there are three component parts to recovery capital. Now, other people have different things, they'll include human and financial and various things, but for me, there are fundamentally three component parts to recovery capital. And it doesn't matter whether you're talking about an individual or a group. And that's a crucial point to me, because this is about social as well as individual level change. The purpose of this model is that the, the core elements of personal self-sustaining recovery capital, self-efficacy, self-esteem, uh, positive identity, communication, coping and resilience skills effectively require scaffolding. And the scaffolding comes from the other two component parts that to afford the individuals the space they require to develop those self-sustaining resources requires social and co collective or community recovery capital. How much of those things it requires will depend on where the individual is. But the social network and the, the identity that falls from the social network is the primary determinant of shaping this. And in the absence of in high levels of indigenous social capital, the community is where the resource must reside and where we require assertive and effective linkages into community resources to enable that change. This is the social contract. This is the Hobbesian social contract, that the groups in the community have to be actively engaged to buy into that process. Because in criminal justice, we talk about a spectrum. At one end is reintegrative shaming. At the other end is disintegrative shaming. Okay, I'm going to ask for a show of hands. Is the crime career of sex offenders any different from the crime career of shoplifters? In other words, do people desist from sex offending at a different age from, uh, than people do from shoplifting? Put your hand up if you think the answer is yes, sex offenders stop much later. Some, the answer is no. They desist at pretty much exactly the same rate and speed. Yet, we don't allow sex offenders to reintegrate per, per perfectly legitimate concerns about child well, well-being and child safety. We, well, if you, certainly, if you live in America, you make people walk about with a big sign over their head saying sex beast, um, which, you know, may well provide protection to the community, but is not great for their reintegration. This is disintegrative shaming. The person is... Um, Punished, but the punishment doesn't stop. Reintegrative shaming, on the other hand, is the mechanisms through which assertively excluded and marginalized populations are effectively reintegrated and reintroduced. 
And in essence, this is the attitudinal component of collective or community recovery capital. The enforcement of stigma and exclusion is the societal contribution to the perpetuation of um, addiction, offending, and all of those collective things. Now, how does this process work? Well, in the work that, that so uh, I'm really unfortunate that one of the main places that I do my work is not Sheffield, but is Florida, um, where we, we work a lot with uh, recovery residences. And we, we uh, towards the end of last year, we, we published a paper in Drug and Alcohol Dependence where we looked at uh, the model of how people build up well-being over time in a population of around 600 uh, individuals going through recovery residences in Florida. And in complete opposite of the UK model. In Florida, if you go into a recovery residence, within three weeks you have to have a job, a sponsor, you have to contribute to the upkeep of the house and you have to take part in Saturday morning street cleaning on the street you work, you live, your recovery residence is on. And the idea is the last part is building up relationships and building up social engagements. This is a structured equation model that you read from bottom left up to top right. And as we know in the literature, the longer time you spend in treatment services, the better your outcomes. And, so, and the, well, there is a pathway here that says, the more time you spend in a recovery residence, the lower the barriers you have to recovery, the less unmet needs you have, the higher well-being you have in terms of psychological health, physical health, and so on. This is a strongly mediated effect. Because for us, what we found for recovery residence clients is, the benefit of time in residence is hugely mediated by the number of meaningful activities people engage in. In other words, time, the, the, the space that recovery residence affords, really only provides opportunity for engaging in volunteering, employment, community uh, uh, engagement, community participation, which in turn builds up recovery capital, both personal and social, which feeds much more strongly into well-being. And this is the social contract part. This is crucial because people can spend lots of time here and have this kind of take away of barriers and take away of obstacles. But the strength-based part relies on the opportunity to access community resources, to be able to get to places where you can get a job, where you can volunteer meaningfully. And that's the pathway to the positive aspect of recovery well-being, that recovery capital builds through this process of engagement <coughs> in meaningful activities. And the work, we're, the work we're doing there basically is around this model of saying, how do you map where somebody is individually in terms of their personal and social recovery capital? And utilize that to guide recovery care planning that links people in to the relevant uh, support systems. So we call this model, oh sorry, yeah, we call this model an MPE model. So there are three phases to this work and this is a, uh, we're not blowing the personal details of Sal Swanson because he is in fact made up. I mean, I have no idea where the photo came from, but anyway, he's made up. But the, the, the idea here is really clear, that you measure the level of recovery resources and recovery capital people have, and you can see when he was done the first time, he wasn't doing very well, lots of reds and ambers, and then he does much better there, which is what happens when you make up cases. Um, <laughs> the point of this is to say that the three phases are, you measure people's resources, their recovery capital, you then create recovery care plans based on the resources they have and the resources they are likely to need. And the third phase is active engagement with community groups and activities to build those resources, to contribute to the well-being of the community, but to build the individual's own recovery capital as a, as a consequence. <coughs> Why should we worry about this? Well, I, I, I probably talked about this before. I'm going to mention this briefly towards the end of what I'm talking about. Is this is from the UK's Life and Recovery Survey. 79.4% of our sample of people in long-term recovery volunteered actively in their local community, contributed to their local community. So the, the, the notion that there's somehow this fantastic idea of uh, 
uh, this idealistic notion that people in recovery will contribute something useful. Well, they do. They do at a much higher rate than people who are not in recovery. They are active participants in their local community. This is part of something we've talked about for a while is the better than well phenomenon. And it's important to recognize that this is not a, a, a be nice to people in recovery because it's a good thing to do. It's because it contributes to this sense of well-being. Why do I keep doing that? Now, before I go on to this, I also want to say we have just finished, we're just about to publish the, the, the first families version of the Life in Recovery survey. So we had 1,565 people complete a survey about two things. One, as witnesses of recovery, and secondly, as people who had their own experience of recovery because of the addiction of a family member. And it's been really striking and dramatic, both the ripple effect of addiction and the ripple effects of recovery. So one of the most astonishing findings is that over 3% of family members report jail time during the addict's period of active addiction. This is something like 30 times higher than the general public you would expect. So 3% of family members go to jail during the period of their family member's addiction. They are not addicted. And I assume this is to do with fighting or uh, acquiring uh, drugs. Don't know. Uh, and it drops to just under 1% when the family member enters recovery. More than 10% of family members report driving under the influence of alcohol or drugs. And more than 60% report been suspended from work or losing jobs as a consequence of familial addiction. These are huge costs and these are totally uncharted. So everything that I've said about people in recovery, there is an echo effect that, that extends on to families and family members. And we increasingly are aware of the fact the pathways are different for men and women. There are different models and pathways and the social pathway appears to apply more for men than it does for women. John Kelly's recent work would suggest that um, the mechanisms of, of recovery change are more reliant on social, social network change for men and changes in abstinence self-efficacy for women. The last thing I'm going to talk about, just briefly mention is we are currently undertaking a study uh, which is a follow-on from the SONAR study that Dan mentioned at the start. Uh, where we're looking at policy effects in four European countries, Scotland, England, uh, Netherlands, and Belgium, um, where we're recruiting people. Uh, I won't be as long as that. Uh, we're recruiting people in 250 people in each of those four countries, half men and half women. Um, and our aim is to look at how recovery happens in terms of the utilization of different mechanisms of behavior change for recovery. Uh, natural recovery, 12-step fellowship recovery, peer-based recovery support, therapeutic community uh, and specialist outpatient treatment. How do people manage pathways to change and what is the role of policy? Because we have two countries, Scotland and England, that have had recovery policies for a decade. And two countries, um, Belgium and, and Netherlands, well, in Belgium it's only the Flemish part of Belgium, not the Walloon part, apparently, uh, have... Uh, have had recovery policies for the last year. And so one of the questions that this study, the, the European Union have funded us to do is to look at, is the establishment of recovery policy a predictor of different pathways to recovery? Uh, and so for, for me, one of the core questions of this model is really about how do these things inform the process of capital growth? And the underlying premise for all of this is Capital growth is individualized. There will be gender differences. There will probably be age and substance differences. There will be local context differences. But the crucial question for me is, this, is, is to understand this process of, for different subpopulations at different points in their careers, how, where are the windows of opportunity for societies and communities to intervene to enable that process of change? And here's an unreadable slide to finish with. Done. Okay, thank you very much.